Good afternoon again. Good morning, wherever you are, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us virtually today. Hopefully you can all see me and hear me all right and, and uh, your connection is good. We've all learned how uh, that this can be pretty challenging sometimes, but hopefully it goes smooth today. Um, so our topic today is wastewater monitoring for public health. We're going to have a, a nice discussion and some conversation and, and later some Q&A. So we know that, especially during this ongoing pandemic, we've really learned how wastewater can contain clues about the health of our local community. Um, it can tell us about the resurgence of diseases that were once thought to be eradicated and the evolution of new diseases like COVID-19 and its ever-changing variants. Um, there's even chemicals you can detect um, in wastewater um, that are residuals from the community that, so for example, you can learn about the prevalence of, of drug use in the given community. Uh, so throughout this pandemic, the science, uh, various scientists, including our speakers today, have been closely tracking uh, the signals of new coronavirus variants and gathering useful data that's produced by this wastewater surveillance research, it's called, to gain real-time information like as new variants emerge. So we're really fortunate that two of the leading scientists on this work and, and working on various related projects are here with us today. So I'm really excited to introduce our two speakers. So I will give you just a brief little bio for each of them, and then I'll turn it over uh, to each of them to make a, a few remarks, and then we'll, we'll have some Q&A. Um, so first, I'd like to introduce Alexandria Baim. Uh, Ali is a professor of civil and environmental engineering at Stanford University in the School of Engineering and a senior fellow at the Woods Institute for the Environment. Her research is focused on key problems in both developed and developing countries with the overarching goal of designing and testing novel interventions and technologies for reducing the burden of disease. And then we also have Marlene Wolf, who is a Stanford alum and did a postdoc in the Stanford Civil and Environmental Engineering Department. And she's now an assistant professor in the Gangarosa Department of Environmental Health at Emory University's Rollins School of Public Health. Her work focuses on developing tools to use environmental detection of pathogens to understand population health and risks and to implement and evaluate interventions that reduce environmental exposure to pathogens. So again, I'd like to welcome Ali and Marlene. And now I'll turn it over to Ali just to give us a few opening remarks. And after Ali, Marlene can do the same. Um, so Ali, if you could, and then Marlene afterwards, um, can you each please take a few minutes just to tell us how you became you know, interested in this topic of wastewater monitoring for public health and tell us about your work. Uh, and Ali, if you could tell us about your work with, with Marlene. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Megan. It's um, it's exciting to be here today. So, yeah, I want to tell you the story about how this project got started. Um, so, I have been working on pathogens in the environment outside the human body for over twenty years now. And um, when we started to hear about the coronavirus disease in China, um, a colleague of mine, Crystal Wigington, who's a professor at University of Michigan, was here on sabbatical and. Krista and I said, well, let's, um, let's put in a proposal to NSF for a rapid grant and get some money so that we can do some research on envelope viruses and we can bring our, you, she could bring her students out here and we could have a great time doing research. And one of the things that we proposed to do was um, to look for envelope viruses in wastewater. So we submitted the grant to NSF and the program officer who was great. He said, you know, I don't really think this is really a thing. Like we're not really, this isn't going to affect the United States. So I don't think this, this is something that we can fund. It's like too far out there. And we were like, okay. So we watched the news and we hear the first case in Santa Clara County and we get really excited and we email the program officer say, there's a case, there's a case in California. And, you know, we do think this is going to be a thing. And he said, okay, okay you know, I'll fund you guys. So he gave us um, maybe about $100,000 to start our research. And so right as the money came into Stanford, the, almost the same day that our grant came, Stanford sent a note to everyone and said, go home and don't come back. And the doors are now locked. And we were like, how in the world are we going to start this research project um, with the doors locked at Stanford? And um, luckily, thanks to the um, department manager and um, department chair and all of our colleagues here at Stanford, 
we were able to figure out how to start this really large research project um, at a time where everyone was extremely worried about the pandemic and unsure what the future held and when life would be able to go back to normal. And we were all told to stay at home. Um, and then, um, you know, we, we started working on the wastewater work right away. We sent emails to a lot of plants all over the country to get them to send us samples. And I had boxes outside my front door because FedEx could not deliver to Stanford. And so that was, you know, a big challenge. And um, after we, we'll talk more about this, I think in the Q and A, but after we started to get, you know, um, encouraging results, we were able to acquire some funding um, from the CDC foundation and scale up our work. Um, to where it is today, where we're actually measuring SARS-CoV-2 and providing um, useful information to public health um, for their response to the pandemic. Um, a really important part of our project has been translation. So we're not just doing um, our research and publishing papers, but we're spending a lot of time talking to colleagues in public health to understand how this data could be useful and how to best serve it up to them so that it is um, useful and something that they can actually make decisions with. And that's been a great learning experience as well. And we're happy to talk more about that in the Q&A. Um, and I'll just say that um, when we started this project in March of 2020, nobody knew if we could detect SARS-CoV-2 in wastewater. And it's just amazing to think that today, two years later, it is a very useful tool for pandemic response. And we know that the concentrations that we measure in wastewater are really informative about infection rates in the community. So we've come such a long way in the last two years. And we're now starting to think about like, what else can we do besides study COVID-19 um, and thinking about how we can expand this to other viruses, other pathogens, and how the information can be used other than um, for a pandemic response. Um, and so I'll turn it over to Marlene who can talk a little bit more about these. Yeah, thank you so much for having us and for hosting this event. I think, um, you know, just to build on everything that Ali has just described about our work, I think, you know, what we had seen is that wastewater monitoring had been used before. And, you know, Ali and I have both focused our careers on looking at pathogens in the environment. And so it wasn't a natural idea to bring these two things together. But the key was that, you know, this had never been done for a respiratory virus. So there have been examples of wastewater monitoring used to track outbreaks of disease. And that's been focused on, um, for example, polio. It's been really being used really effectively to um, look at polio outbreaks. But this was the first time that um, we were proposing to use this for uh, a respiratory disease. So going from that, where we had our kind of first moments working kind of under duress in a pandemic in the lab, just to even get samples in there and test them and, and seeing that we could in fact detect SARS-CoV-2 in the wastewater to go from that to where we are today, where we have sort of, um, you know, international and national support for this type of work where it's becoming a true piece of the public health toolbox. It's been an amazing journey that we've taken over the past two years. And so, you know, the idea that we could track again, respiratory viruses in wastewater two years ago was not something that we really ever thought about. And then now we have extended that. We're looking at other respiratory viruses in wastewater, including influenza and RSV. And so at this point, the possibilities really seem endless in terms of how we can use this as a way of looking at what is the population level health. You know, if you use the bathroom, you're contributing to our sample. The majority of the United States is attached to a sewer network. And so that means that you're contributing your sample. You don't have to encounter the healthcare system. You don't have to have a swab stuck up your nose and you'll be represented in an anonymous way. And so that is really powerful for public health when we have the challenge of aggregating data, whether it's on you know, COVID, on outbreak diseases that we see regularly like influenza or sort of the next new thing that comes along to be able to see at a community level what's happening is really, really powerful. And so, um, I mean, I think 
Allie has already said this, but we would be remiss if we didn't sort of immediately acknowledge that the reason that this has been so successful and we've been able to scale to, um, you know, pretty high frequency sampling at a lot of places around the Bay Area and then now expending, extending nationally, the reason we've been able to do that is because of our close relationships with utilities and public health and, and all of the people who have, um, you know, believed in this data before it was even clear whether or not it was going to be useful, believed that it was a good idea, were willing to put their time and resources and energy towards contributing, taking samples, looking at the data with us, evaluating it against clinical case data and doing all of that work um, during a time of, of a pandemic. It's, it's been really intense. It's been an intense past two years for everybody. And that's absolutely been true for us and everybody who's contributed to this work. So it's been an amazing experience of, of everybody coming together. And, you know, we, we just feel like this has been our, our service to the pandemic, the way that we can, can help give back. Like what expertise do we have, you know, environmental microbiology and environmental engineering and the ways that applies to public health. And so um, I feel really fortunate that we've had the support from, you know, all of our collaborators and donors and everybody to be able to, to realize that throughout this pandemic. And there's so much potential now going forward. Um, so yeah, I'm excited to have this discussion today. Wow, such a huge effort and a real team effort with all these different folks that you've worked with. That's amazing. Um, so we can transition to some Q&A now, and I have a few questions to start us off, and then we'll um, take some questions from the, from the audience. Um, you mentioned, uh, maybe Marlene could start with you. You mentioned that, um, you know, a couple years ago, folks didn't even realize, didn't even know if this would even work, right? Like, could you see uh, such a virus in the wastewater? Do you think the reason it, it worked is because, gosh, there's just so much virus, more than anyone ever might have thought in that, you know, composite community sample? Or is it that the method is just so incredibly sensitive or a little bit of both, maybe? Why was it a surprise, maybe, that you could detect it? Well, I, I think that's a good question. And I think it's because we think of this as, as a respiratory virus, right? But it turns out that um, you know, most viruses and, and SARS-CoV-2 is one, it doesn't just affect one part of your body, right? And so one of the reasons we thought this was likely to be successful early on is because we knew from early case reports from China that there was fecal shedding of the virus, that people who were infected did have the virus in their feces. Now, I don't know that that's a prerequisite for being able to use wastewater monitoring because there's a lot of bodily fluids that go into wastewater, so it doesn't have to be just feces, but that gave us a really good sign that this would be likely to work. Um, but I, so that's why it was sort of didn't fit into the box that we sort of thought of, you know, we tended right. to think of enteric viruses as what we would focus on, but um, the method is actually incredibly sensitive. There are a lot of methods that are, are work for isolating the virus from wastewater. We've focused on the solids in wastewater. So, I mean, the solids in wastewater are mostly fecal, and also we know that viruses like SARS-CoV-2 partition into the solids in wastewater, so they're sticky to the wastewater solids. So what we've seen in our work is that we can detect the virus in wastewater when there are as few as just a couple cases per 100,000 people in the population. Um, and that, so it's a very, you know, there doesn't have to be a lot of, a lot of virus actually, or a lot of people who are infected in the community for us to um, actually detect it in wastewater. And that's part of what's so powerful is to be able to find that needle in the haystack, be able to see there's just even a single case in this larger community or a few cases in this larger community without having to, to find those people and, um, you know, mm -hmm. stick something up their nose. Mm -hmm. And actually I was going to ask why you measure the solids, but you just, you just mentioned that. I think you said, you know, that this virus you know, or you figured it out, I guess, along the way that it partitions more to the solids. So can you talk a little bit more about how that works in the method? Because I think of wastewater sample as the water. So how do you get to those solids? And then how do you analyze those solids for the virus? Uh, it's sort of in, in a general, in general terms, since we don't have all, you know, molecular biologists in the, in the audience. Yeah, let me, um, I'm going to do a good job. I promise of um, sharing my screen here. Um, okay, here we go. Um, so this is on the left here. 
a schematic that shows a wastewater treatment plant. So here you have the wastewater that's coming into the treatment plant. And then there are all these different steps that goes through this process to then be treated and be discharged back into the environment in a way that is, is clean. Um, and so we're, we don't really, we're not really that worried about the treatment part of this. The SARS-CoV-2 in wastewater is not infectious. What we're really worried about is at the very beginning here, getting trapping the wastewater as it's coming in and then using that for our measurements. And so there are two different ways that we can look at a sample that it has more solids. We can look at getting a sample from this primary clarifier. So it's often the first step in the treatment process is a tank where the solids just settle out. So we can take a sample from there that already has more solids in it. And then the other thing we can do, this is a picture from the Stanford campus, actually. Um, we can take liquid wastewater that's coming into the plant, that influent wastewater, and we can just allow it to settle for a few minutes and get the solids out in the bottom there. You can see kind of after that 15 minutes of settling, there's a there's a chunk there at the bottom of solids that's thicker. And so we, we take that and then use that for the downstream process to then isolate the viral genome and look for um, particular targets within the gene using uh, genome using a PCR-based test. So it's the same type of test that you'd use for um, clinical testing, um, but we have all that kind of um, preparation that we do to the sample that's quite different for wastewater versus a clinical sample to then be able to target with a, a PCR test like that. Okay, great. Yeah, the pictures are, are helpful. Um, so maybe maybe if I can ask the question now of Ali, um, but sticking on the, the topic of methods, although I don't know that we'll need this slide, so I think it's probably okay. Um, so Ali, um, you know, I imagine you did a lot of work on kind of getting the methods to this point in terms of the laboratory technique. Um, did the situation, did this work in the pandemic lead to really development of new methods or better methods? Or was it more about taking existing, um, you know, methods you already had and were they like ready to go for this virus? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I feel like there's been a revolution in the past 10 years or more in molecular biology in terms of our ability to detect uh, pathogens and rare targets um, in the environment. And by rare target, I mean something that is not super abundant, like pathogens outside the human body. Um, but there's sort of, it's sort of like the wild, wild west a little bit in environmental engineering um, and environmental science, environmental microbiology. And so one thing, one way that I, so one way that I think that the methods advanced over the pandemic is a lot of researchers got on the same page about what kind of controls need to be run, um, what kind of sensitivity should we be expecting what kind of replication is required. And so that, that really advanced in the pandemic. So um, the methods for detecting viruses in wastewater, those exist for a lot of viruses, but maybe not necessarily the viruses that we're interested in. So for example, nobody had a um, PCR assay for SARS-CoV-2 before like, you know, the virus emerged in China. Um, and then there were assays that people had developed for clinical samples that then had to be tested in the environment where there's different types of organisms and different pieces of nucleic acid that could cross react. Um, and then as new variants have arisen, we've had to develop new assays that target um, characteristic mutations in the variant so that we can detect those in wastewater. Um, and then as we've progressed and wanted to use wastewater to see if we can um, use it for RSV or influenza or other respiratory viruses, there isn't a um, bunch of literature on assays for respiratory viruses in wastewater because people haven't looked for them there before. So we've had to develop and test new assays for, for those. So there has been, um, there have been advances in technologies and we're using kind of an older technology that is um, PCR. We use digital droplet PCR for our work, um, but there has been a lot of advances in like new assay development. Great, great, thank you. 
So kind of switching gears, um, but another question for, for Ali. Um, you talked about um, translation being an important part of, of the work. And you mentioned in particular, you know, translating it to um, public health official, uh, you know, staff and officials. But what about um, more the general public or, or say the press? Have you had interaction with, with the press because of this work? I, I would guess so. And if so, like, how do you feel about the way that the press reports the work in their, in their more general writing intended for the public? And then are there other ways that the get information gets out to the general public besides the media as the, as the medium? <laughs> Yeah, we've had a lot of interactions with the press and they've generally been very positive. Um, and it's it's been fun, I think, for Marlene and I to um, learn how to interact with them and get practice with um, communicating with the public. Um, generally, it seems like the journalists want to educate the pub public and seem pretty balanced, but there's always the desire, I think, to be a little sensational um, it, for to get people's attention. Um, but I, I think that's a really important tool and something that we've talked about, like, especially now, like, how do we use the press and how do we educate the public more so that they understand what they're seeing um, in our data? And and the the public is really interested in our data. Marlene and I get emails from the general public quite a bit saying, you know, when's the date, like after the holidays, we had a little lag in our daily data and people were emailing us and saying, why haven't you updated the data? We hope the project hasn't stopped yet. And so we know that the public is looking at our dashboard and mm -hmm. interpreting our results and they're asking us questions about the results. So we know there's a lot of interest and we're thinking about um, how getting the public educated is actually a way to um, ensure that this technology sticks around and is can be can continue to be used into the future. Um, and I think another way that the public can be educated is through like education campaigns that are from um, public health officials through Santa Clara County, for example, they have an, a website devoted to the wastewater at their county website. And even Stanford just launched their um, public facing website with the wastewater data from campus just yesterday. So um, I think those efforts are, are great as well for educating the public. Okay. And there, actually at this point, I, I will turn it over to, um, I'll, I'll start looking at the audience questions and this next, this first question ties into, I think what you were just talking about, Ali. So maybe we can build on that a little more um, tying in, in the public. Um, so this question asks, um, how can water professional water professionals and public health professionals that are interested in pandemic response really help participate in community recovery? So for thinking about your work or your interactions, are there specific suggestions you might have for how you know water folks or public health folks um, can get more involved to help support these efforts or pen, or overall just pandemic you know resilience and preparedness as well? Well, I think one thing that we've learned through the pandemic is that the wastewater data can be a really valuable tool for informing pandemic response. And Marlene, can you put up that first slide from Santa Clara County um, to show to show this? I want to illustrate what I'm talking about here. Um, while she's doing that, I'll just say that, as Marlene mentioned, we are expanding what we're doing and we're looking for more wastewater treatment plants to participate in our project and um, more public health agencies. So if anyone in the audience is interested, please get in touch with us if you want to um, be involved in wastewater-based epidemiology. So I just wanna show here this um, plot which shows um, almost two years of data from um, Santa Clara County. And in the bottom is the data from the wastewater and it shows these peaks that occurred over time and they're labeled with surges that we're familiar with. So the so-called first surge when the virus first arrived in the Bay Area, the summer surge of 2020, the winter surge of 2021, the Delta surge, and then the recent Omicron surge. And if you look at the case data from Santa Clara County in the top plot, you can see this really just amazing agreement between the data and the, case, and the cases. And this is something that we see across all of the locations where we're working. 
But what I want to point out is that the very first surge that we see so clearly in the wastewater being almost as big as the summer surge of 2020 is just non-existent in the case data. And that's because when the virus first emerged, there was no testing infrastructure, like very, very limited testing infrastructure. And you might remember that you couldn't get a COVID test if you hadn't recently traveled to China. There were these other criteria. So at that time, we were ill-equipped to, um, to really get a sense of the um, prevalence or incidence of COVID-19 in the community. But the wastewater did tell us that the, the incidence of, of the disease. So if, if we ever have another pandemic or, or when we do, we could easily go to the wastewater right away and be able to tell if the virus has arrived and get a sense for how um, widespread it is. So mm -hmm. I think that that is a way that this can prepare us for um, a future pandemic to have this tool ready to go. Right, right. That's incredible. Um, okay, another question that we we received, and maybe Marlene, if you wouldn't mind um, answering this one, and then I think perhaps Ali could as well. Um, so, sort of these big picture questions, which I think can be can be more difficult, right? Because as scientists or biologists, we focus on our, our technical work, but uh, especially in your work on this, you it's it's so much. It's beyond the immediate, you know, laboratory methods and research, and has such a big impact. So the question is, are, is there one particular thing or, or maybe you have two or three that you feel like we should remember from this pandemic and then teach uh, our families and future students, um, our communities, um, you know, based on your experiences? Something so something we should remember and uh, teach to our communities and families and students. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm going to go for maybe low hanging fruit here in a way and say, I think that like quite clearly what we've learned is that wastewater monitoring should be a part of our national infrastructure far into the future. You know, that plot that, uh, you know, Ali was just describing where we saw clearly a picture in the wastewater of what was happening with the disease when we didn't see that in clinical data. Unfortunately, we didn't have that data in real time, right? We were developing the methods, we were working on it. Had we had it, everyone in public health, we've showed that plot too. It's like, man, if we had had that in real time, that would have been incredible. And so that has been our goal now since we kind of did that first analysis to show, wow, look, we could see what in the in the wastewater, what we couldn't see because things needed to be developed and implemented. And there's so much new that has to happen when there's a new disease you're contending with. You know, if we had had that in the beginning, how much more could we have, have been informed about our response? And so our our whole process since then has been about not just building better methods, building better ways of looking at the data, but has been about saying, you know, how can we create a program that can provide this data and can transition rapidly to new threats and have that ready to go <laughs> so that the next time we have something new, we're ready for it. And that's exactly what happened in a way with Omicron this winter. You know, we have been running now at this point um, a program for wastewater monitoring for uh, since November 2020. We took that original information. We said, what could this do? How could this be powerful if this was really implemented for public health? So we have daily sampling and we get results within 24 hours of getting these samples. And so we had that well in place. We'd been doing it for a year by the time the Omicron surge came up. And we had started looking for new variants, which Ali just described, you know, developing new tests to look at mutations that are specific to new variants. Variants. And so we were able to implement testing for Omicron in wastewater, and we were able to see that Omicron arrived in several communities, either before or right at the same time as we identified clinical cases in those areas. So I think that, you know, I what we've learned is that we can't we can't let everything that we've developed here go to waste. This is going to be 
I think a cornerstone of how we track infectious disease in our communities going forward. And that also means that there are so many opportunities for researchers, professionals to get involved in this work. And I see more and more that I have students who I'm working with now who are interested in going to our public health departments and supporting as a career this type of work. And so that is very exciting to see and um, is really something we can we can capitalize on going forward the effort during this pandemic. Right, right. Ali, is there anything you wanted to add to that as far as, um, you know, things to remember from the pandemic and sharing with family or students or the community? Well, I think Marlene um, hit it on the head for, for our work on wastewater. I mean, I think there's a lot of other lessons that transcend yeah. the wastewater work. Um, but I don't know if I want to get it. <laughs> sure, pick one, Allie. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Um, another question from uh, the audience here is, so how will the research transfer to everyday use by utilities and by public health agencies? Is this method ready for general application? Want to take that, Allie? Sure. I, yes, it absolutely is ready for general application. And it is. We have been very open access with all of our methods. They're all publicly available for free on protocols.io. Um, we've been working with a commercial lab called Verily um, in South San Francisco. And but there are other people who have been using our methods. And so it is ready to go off the shelf. We know of um, colleagues at like San Jose wastewater treatment plant that are standing up a lab facility um, at their plant using our methods. Another commercial lab um, called Eurofins is using our methods. So it is ready to go. Great. Do you have a sense for, um, and Ali, if you wanna take this one as well, the time lag between the community uh, COVID-19 outbreak and when you then, you know, subsequently detect it in the wastewater? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I think that there's been some um, confusion about this because there were some early reports that the wastewater data led the case, the case data by weeks. And um, actually what we find in our data, which um, we can show again, maybe Marlene, the slide of the case data and the wastewater data from some of our plants um, is that the case data and the wastewater data are like one to one. So these plots show data from three plants and you can see the wastewater data is in blue and shaded and the red data is the case data. Um, and I know this is a really long time period so it would be hard to see if the case data were offset by a week but basically what we find is a one-to-one -one relationship between the case data and the wastewater data. And that's shown in those plots up there as well. And so basically um, you don't start shedding the virus um, into wastewater before you are really getting sick. So it's not like people start shedding the virus and then a week later they get sick. Um, what we would find is that it, you know, people are going and getting a specimen collected and about the time they're going to get a specimen collected, at least in the past when PCR testing was readily available, that's about the time when they were shedding the most virus and contributing the most to the wastewater. So those early reports where people are reporting that the wastewater leads the case data, what that refers to is the fact that the case data is lagged in reporting. So if if you go and get tested, there's the date of your specimen collection, which is the date we use on these plots, but there's also the report date. It's the date that you get the results back and that they get reported to public health officials. And depending on when we are in the pandemic, that lag in reporting has been anywhere from um, a few days to over a week. And I'm sure we've all experienced that wait there. Um, so moving forward though, actually most of us are using rapid tests. So we're not going to get PCR tests and those rapid tests aren't reportable. 
So um, you can see in this in this plot at the very end how the case data is kind of not quite matching with the wastewater data. This is just cases of like PCR tests or or um, lamp tests that do nucleic acid amplification that are reportable to public health. Rapid tests are not on here. So moving forward, I know I personally plan to take as many rapid tests as possible and avoid getting something stuck up my nose that makes me cry. Um, mm -hmm. And that data is not going to be captured by the case data that public health has. So in the future, there may not be very reliable case data to compare the wastewater data to, but the wastewater will be a good reflection of incident cases in the sewer sheds where the wastewater right. comes from. Right, right, okay. Um, here's a question for, um, let's see, Marlene, if you could answer this one. Um, so, is it possible to test for the presence of the antibodies in the wastewater? And can you differentiate between antibodies generated by a vaccine versus generated by the actual virus? Yeah, this is a, this is a good question um, and very timely because we just had a, a paper accepted that talks about this topic. So I think we're always interested in, are there new and better ways to detect the virus in wastewater? Are there new and better ways to track? I mean, we know that wastewater is an amazing sample and source of information and there's a lot of stuff in there. And so I think that... Um, it's an interesting area of inquiry. And what we've seen in some preliminary testing is that we are able to detect the SARS-CoV-2 proteins in wastewater. Um, we have continued to work with the PCR data and looking at the genome because it has worked really well. And we've seen sort of um, that wonderful association that you just saw. It's possible that we could develop more and better tools to see that with antigen, but at a first glance, we didn't uh, see that quite come out quite as clearly. And using the, um, looking at the viral RNA and looking at the viral genome, it gives us a lot of opportunity to target specific areas that we're interested in. So we're able to look at, um, you know, not only areas of the genome that are conserved, and so they represent what all SARS-CoV-2 is that's in the wastewater coming from everybody who may be infected in the community, but also mutations that are characteristic of certain variants. So we can look really rapidly at, you know, here is a new sequence that's popping up in a variant that we're concerned about. We're going to design a test to target that and look at the overall amount of that variant in wastewater compared to the amount of the total. So we can see sort of um, the pr proportion of cases that are attributed to a certain variant versus the other change over time. So um, I think that we've seen the tools for doing all of that with the PCR-based testing has been really robust, but it's always exciting to expand our, our idea of what we can do with the wastewater and what's in that sample. Okay, all right. And Marlene, another question for you, um, per perhaps related. Um, is thinking about the vaccination level of the community and how this might affect results. So, you know, how does that affect the results, this type of, of monitoring? Um, and does any, does your knowledge of the vaccination level in the community affect the, your interpretation or should it, if you knew that information? Yeah, I think that's a really important question. What we see and have continued to see throughout many changes in the pandemic, so changes in you know the extent to which people are moving around, changes in the different variants and how infectious they are and exactly how, how they infect us, changes in the immune status of the population, whether that's because people have been infected or because they've been vaccinated. We've seen throughout that whole time period that I just showed this consistent relationship between new cases in the community and the wastewater data, the amount of SARS-CoV-2 in the wastewater. What, what would not be consistent throughout that time is the relationship between the wastewater data and hospitalizations maybe, right? Because how many of those cases in the community are ending up needing to be hospitalized, how many people need to be hospitalized given a certain number of cases, we know that that has changed over time, right, with different variants that we've seen and with people being vaccinated or, you know, experiencing reinfection. Mm -hmm. And so 
we want to think about this as a tool for public health, both to you know understand what are the circulating levels of virus in the community for us to even use, as we know that many people in the areas where our data is publicly available use this to check and see kind of like, well, what are my COVID levels outside today? You know, just like what's my air quality or what are my pollen counts? You know, to get a sense of like if I go to the grocery store how can I make a personal decision about how risky this feels to me based on what I see in terms of the number of cases in the community? Public health officials, you know, are going to want to, you know, do the same thing of encouraging people to have that awareness and, you know, behave differently depending on the levels of, of virus in the community, but then also to think about, well, what is the severity of what we're experiencing right now in terms of the particular variant that's in circulation and what the vaccination status is of the community to figure out things like hospital forecasting, you know, what, what might I need my resources to be at the hospitals if I see that I have something coming? Well, it's going to be a little bit different what that prediction will be based on some of those other factors. But we've seen consistently it's the number of cases in the community that's closely associated with the concentration of virus in the wastewater. So it's not a, you know, there's many other sources of data that come into making decisions. And we know that, you know, clinical testing, we don't want to badmouth clinical testing. It's absolutely essential for diagnosis and treatment and, and very complementary to what we're doing with the wastewater. Um, but it gives us a different perspective that can be really useful. Right, right. Thank you. So I think, um, Allie, if you could... Um answer this question. I'm trying to remember if it was Ali or, or Marlene that made this comment and this builds on it. So hopefully I remembered correctly, but we talked about, um, Ali, I think that, that that high sensitivity where if there's only, you know, one to two cases, I think for a hundred thousand, was that it, that you can detect it in the wastewater. Um, if I'm understanding this question correctly, he, he says it suggests in stream is very well mixed up. So I assume that's the the, it's not the assumption that when you collect that wastewater, you're getting a very well mixed, you know, representative sample. Do you have any comments on that as far as how how appropriately representative is the the sample that you collect? Either it sounds like I think we talked about solids from the beginning yeah. of the wastewater treatment plant. Yeah, that's a great question. I think it's a little it's a little um, unintuitive, like how this would be able to capture that few of people. So the samples that we collect, if we collect um, influent and then settle the solids, that's always a 24 hour composite sample. Um, so it's basically taking the sampling devices set up to take a little sip of wastewater from the influent going into the plant like every 30 minutes and then compositing that. And um, if we collect a sample from the primary clarifier, the solids that we're collecting have actually accumulated and been mixed over at least several hours. So it also represents a composite sample. So despite all the complexities of the sewer network where it takes sewage anywhere from, you know, less than an hour or maybe even 24 hours, depending on how the system is set up to get from a house to the wastewater treatment plant, despite the complexities of mixing and um, the temporal variability that you might expect in the influent, surprisingly, perhaps, like we still see this really consistent relationship um, between what we measure in the wastewater and the incidence of, of disease in the sewer shed. And have you convinced yourself with, with replicates? Like if you get that composite, that's like the primary clarifier solids. And if you grab, you know, an hour apart or something, it should be mostly the same, right? And you get the same result. Like I get, you talked about how it's really that quality control side that there's been a lot of improvements inspired by, by the pandemic, convincing yourself that the data is real through appropriate control. So maybe you can elaborate on that a little more, um, you know, not necessarily the replication question, yeah. but just in general, whatever quality control you think is most important or where you well, learn something surprising perhaps. Yeah, um, I'm trying to think of learning of what we learned that was surprising. Maybe Marlene can think of a surprising thing in a minute, but I we have done some studies comparing like a grab sample with a composite sample of influent and seeing that the grab sample can be less representative when there's fewer people shedding the virus in the sewer shed, which conceptually kind of makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, and then 
so, so that's the kind of um, analysis that we've done. And, and interestingly, across all of our sewer sheds where we're actively working, so we work with 11 different wastewater treatment plants, and then there's the Stanford site on campus. Um, they all collect solids in slightly different ways. So at one plant, they do a manual composite sample. So they get um, a sample every eight hours from the primary clarifier every single day for the last like two years <laughs> for us. Um, and they have an actual operator do that and manually composite the sample. We have some plants that just grab a sample from the primary clarifier. We have other plants that settle the solids from influent. And we have the Stanford site, which also settles the solids from like a liquid sample. And at first we thought, oh, we're gonna see like really different results across these plants using different collection methods. We don't, they're all very similar. They all collapse on the same line of the case data and the wastewater mm -hmm. data. So, I mean, I think in terms of being surprised and Marlene can say what she's been surprised about. I'm just surprised that everything works as well as it's worked given the complexities that we all understand about the engineering of a wastewater treatment plant, of the sewage infrastructure, shedding, variability in shedding, which we haven't even discussed um, in this talk, um, variability in when people go to the bathroom and whether they go to the bathroom. And uh, yeah, there's just, there's so many complexities to think about and yet it all comes together with like as such an amazing tool. I think that's kind of the biggest surprise to me in this whole project. Mm -hmm. Marlene, did you want to add anything as far as general surprises or, or, or on the quality control kind of side element side of things? Yeah, I, I think it's been, it, it has just been amazing. Like sometimes when I reflect on the fact that we take a vanishingly small amount of solids. You know, it's it's actually much less than one gram of solids that goes into the extraction kit. And in some cases for our treatment plants, that can represent up to around 2 million people in less than a gram of wastewater solids. And it's consistent. It consistently performs every time. And what's amazing is that we have seen that across, you know, two years of the pandemic for SARS-CoV-2 with all the changes that we've seen. So I think, you know, as Ali described, it all, we, we have gone and looked at every piece of this process to the extent that we can, looking at replication, thinking about fecal shedding, thinking about persistence in the wastewater system and thinking about, you know, how, how is it affected if you have a system that um, has storm water enter it or not, right? There are so many different things that can affect how these systems work, but on a population level, that very small sample continues to give us really consistent information about infection. And then what is even more amazing to me is that we've started to see that extend into other viruses. So I just like use this opportunity, I think, because this is one of the things that has been most exciting to show, um, share this data that we have on respiratory syncytial virus. So that it, that's a respiratory virus, RSV, that causes um, severe disease in kids, very, very young kids, and sometimes in elderly people. But it kind of presents as the common cold in people who are, are you know, healthy children or adults and then influenza. And so these are just a couple examples of other, um, you know, data that we have from this project, looking at the relationship between those targets in wastewater. Again, a couple more respiratory viruses in wastewater and clinical data. So you see, this is influenza. This is the clinical data on the top here. And then this is the wastewater data on the bottom. And we see a very, very similar consistent relationship as we do with SARS-CoV-2. And then this for RSV, this is the statewide positivity rate for RSV in California on the top here. And then this is the wastewater data from two of our treatment plants on the bottom. And I mean, so the fact that we can take, you know, less than a gram of wastewater solids and be able to get this information consistently about multiple targets that have public health importance. I, I mean, I think it's really been, um, it's been a wild ride to be on for the past couple of years. <laughs> so Marlene, perhaps this ties in well to the, the next question. If you had more funding, what <laughs> research questions would you want to answer next? 
Yeah. Well, I think that there are, there are two major things when we think about resources, like what can we leverage our resources towards in, in this space? One is helping make sure that this gets enshrined as, as a public health monitoring system that we can use into the future. And so a, a lot of our work right now is we are focused on supporting this um, program that we're scaling nationally. So we're, it's called Wastewater Scan. And so we are continuing to roll that out to sites around the country to be able to have a consistent um, approach to generating this data for COVID, for variants, for the next thing, for, for RSV and influenza are included in that. And so I think that that is an important part of the next step is to be able to look at, you know, um, providing this data everywhere, making it available to public health departments and the work that we've done with the public health departments that have been using our data up until now, that has been an important part of our research is figuring out how can this be used? How does that translate? translation work. And, you know, I mean, I'm in a school of public health, so I'm like that application I think is extremely exciting and important. The other piece is extending this to other, other pathogens. And so that's something else we're actively working on is saying, well, let's make sure that we have a whole panel of respiratory pathogens, you know, then next of also enteric pathogens also of, you know, particularly high alert diseases that we might, we might want to know about developing and validating tests for all of those things in wastewater. Mm -hmm. And then finally, I think that there are some outstanding questions about things like Ali alluded to fecal shedding. So trying to understand, you know, how much of the virus do people shed in their feces? And what is the time course of that look like? What are the concentrations over time? How can we get better data for that, for COVID, for other diseases to help us do, um, you know, really good modeling of what the disease dynamics in a community look like based on what we're seeing in the wastewater. So we've done a lot, but there's still, there's still a lot uh, to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you question for, for Ali, um, and we're getting close to end of time. So we've got a few high voted questions. So let's try to knock a few of them out with maybe some short answers. Um, let's see here. Okay. So Ali, um, have you had to explain to the press or the general public that finding COVID in wastewater shouldn't deter water recycling projects? I get fearful that the wrong message will get out there in the public several decades ago, quote, toilet to tap headlines yeah. killed some planned with water recycling projects. Right. Yeah. Um, no, that hasn't come up mostly because we, we, we tried to squash that in the very beginning of the pandemic. There was, there were some concerns, but the virus is, there's been no evidence that the virus is infectious in wastewater. No one's been successful at um, cultivating it from wastewater. And also they're very limited, like maybe one or two reports of infectious virus in stool. Um, and there's an understanding that the virus mostly gets inactivated as it travels through the gut. So that's, that's and the, not only that, but the water treatment process, the wastewater treatment process is really effective at removing envelope viruses from wastewater. Right. And recycled water would be yeah disinfected as part of that right. treatment yeah. process specifically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, okay. Another question, Ali, um, what have been the largest infrastructure barriers to making this ongoing program uh, for all future pandemics? Um, yeah. yeah start with I, that. I think one of the biggest challenges in this project is socializing this idea of this tool that requires cooperation between wastewater treatment plants and public health officials. And they are in, at least in California, they're kind of separate, like institutionally. And so um, building those relationships and that trust, I think, has been something that we've worked really hard on and it's been successful. But I think there's still some some can some work to be done and so that's the it's not like physical infrastructure it's like um social infrastructure yeah institutional say. institutional infrastructure yeah. yeah kind of a related question um we had a couple similar ones getting down to more of the small scale so we talked about how this solid sample is you know that basically the whole sewer shed community but you can go more and more micro, like a, a neighborhood or a, like, or a campus, like campus neighborhood, and then even down to maybe like a, a, a senior home of uh, elderly folks to see if there, there could be virus on that site. Like, is it really practical to perhaps get to that point someday and get that very specific community data? 
Yeah, I mean, there's been a lot of people working on that and also prisons, I think, is another location where there's a lot of interest in this, like at the block level. Um, and I think it comes down to like basically costs and effort. So at what point is sending someone out to like open a manhole um, or a person hole, <laughs> I guess, to get a sample um, more expensive and more time intensive than actually just going and getting like swabbing or doing a pooled sample. Um, so there are people kind of looking at those trade-offs and on Stanford campus, we actually looked at sampling dorms and um, at the building scale. And I think we just decided on campus that the most useful information would be a larger like pooled sample from 10,000 people. So I think it is possible. It has been done. I guess the question is whether it is sustainable or not. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you both so much. We are at the top of the hour, so we're going to have to finish up. Um, there's so many good questions. Sorry, we couldn't get to them all. Um, fascinating answers, fascinating topics. So thank you again, Ali and Marlene, so much. Your work really is an inspiration. Um, I'm sure all the attendees, I certainly enjoyed um, the conversation very much. Thank you so much, everyone, and have a wonderful afternoon.